Morning, everyone. How y'all doing? I'm turning this off. All I need is somebody calling me in the middle of this. I love coming up here when Bruce is playing because I know I'm not going to be the, the only one wearing boots. <laughs> My name is Russ. I'm, uh, I'm on the teaching team here at Grace. And uh, if you haven't been welcomed by anyone this morning, you can't say that anymore. Welcome. Glad you're here. Y'all, uh, y'all start opening up your Bibles or your Bible apps or however it is that you like to look at God's Word. Open up to chapter 13. We're looking at verses 8 to 14. And then we're going we're gonna to put a finger in uh, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, because we're going to really rely heavily on, on that as our context this morning. For those of y'all who don't know me, my name is Russ. Uh, I'm on, I was on staff here at Grace for four years, and I'm And though I'm not on staff anymore, I'm I'm blessed that Brian lets me share the pulpit a few times a year. And and, and when I get to do this, uh, I consider it a privilege. Uh, There's there's not a lot of things I love more in life. So, I mean, uh, among those things are coaching my kids, which I got to do before uh, the first service today. I coached my son playing flag football for about the first half hour, uh, and then I had to come here. I had to. And I love just, I love, I love spending time with my family and breaking down the word with my brothers and sisters and, and presenting myself before God so that he might sanctify us. It's, it's among my favorite things to do in life. In Romans 12 and following, we learn that God is most glorified when we have a single, unified heartbeat. That's how he says he's most glorified, one heartbeat, okay? Not when we function as individuals, but when we're, we're, we have a singular heartbeat focused, unified heartbeat. And so this morning, we're going to see that when we love God, we are then able to love people because of the sanctifying work of God, the Holy Spirit in us. And don't worry, I'm going to define some terms here if you don't know that word. Got a lot of work to do and not a lot of time to do it in. Got a lot happening this morning. Stank in front of us. See what happens in there later. So um, let's get after it. And if you'll pray for me, I'll pray for you. Deal? Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm grateful to be with my family this morning. Lord, I pray that as we jump into your word, that you will ready our hearts. Because truth be told, that's what you're dealing with this morning specifically. That after 11 chapters of you showing us what it means to love you, now you're going to look at us and say, all right, now let me tell you what to do with it. Love your neighbors yourself. So God, we pray this, and Lord, I, I, I pray knowing that you are good. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, and all God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. All right, our chapter 13 text opens up this morning with Paul hearkening back to chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And really, everything that comes after Romans 12, 1 and 2 is this, is this unpacking of, a, of the massive statement that Paul makes. I'm going to read it for us here. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice acceptable to God. He's saying this is your spiritual worship. Which is your spiritual worship? service of worship, presenting yourself to God. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Those two verses change everything about the Christian life because they define what, what uh, a grace that sanctifies. Our text this morning is about loving our neighbor, but we can't go anywhere about, about our neighbor until we remember the context of loving my neighbor, which is love God. The first four of the Ten Commandments are about loving God. I paraphrase them for us here this morning, okay? Don't have any other gods before me. Don't make any idols. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And so these four commandments are about God. Love God is their collective theme. You can see that. If we miss the point of these four verses, we miss the point of our text this morning. Being sanctified from verses 12, 1 and 2 
it changes everything about how we function and love in this world. We no longer love like we love, like us, okay? We, like, like we love one another. It, as he transforms us from the inside out, we start transforming how we love. The more he sanctifies us, which means he changes us to be more like him and less like us, the more we love like God loves. And the only way to love others in the way that God loves is for him to be everything to us and for us. So the second commandment of the great commandment of Christ, we, we see both of those in, in, in Matthew chapter 22. I don't have it for you on the screen, but I want to tell you what it is. So Christ lays out in Matthew 22 that there's, there's two great commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And, 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 in, and in 22, he says something amazing after that. He says, upon these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. Everything is based on that. This is coming out of Christ's own, own mouth. It's the basis for our text this morning. And it's essential to understand that so we can actually get at what Paul lays out for us. Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, read like this. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And so the first four commandments are about God, and then the next six commandments we see are about our neighbor and how we are supposed to treat one another. We see, we see a few of these in verse 9. Okay? The remaining love people or love your neighbor commandments are honor your father and mother. Okay, I paraphrase them again. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give a false witness. Don't covet of all variety. Okay? Orthodox uh, people will, Orthodox Jewish people will actually say there's 14 of these because there's a, a couple of them are, are expanded. Verse 8 tells us love is a debt that will never be satisfied. Love is a debt that will never be satisfied. The author Paul starts out by comparing a debt that we owe to someone to how we're to love one another. Okay? Expect that you're going to pay it. Verse 8 says, we are literally supposed to have a debt of love to other people and that we are literally never going to satisfy that love debt. Paul says, we owe love to others. I don't know how comfortable I am with that. We're never supposed to satisfy that, that debt. Less comfortable. I've dealt with debt and, and unsatisfaction of, in all sorts of my life, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room. I've dealt with insomnia since I was about 28 years old, which that's two or three years now. <laughs> what are you laughing about? About 17 years. I'm 45. That's the math. For those of y'all who are going right there like I would. Real insomnia. Okay, when Kelly and I were first married, uh, we were both in graduate school in Kansas City, and I would sleep about two to four hours a night. And there's no reason at all. I just didn't sleep. And while I still deal with insomnia, I do get a little bit more sleep than two to four hours a night. We moved to Kansas City in January of 06 for grad school from San Diego, and, and Kelly was working on her master's degree in Christian counseling, and I was working on my master's degree in biblical languages. And I'll admit something to you about insomnia, okay? It's not always a bad thing. At least, well, okay, I stupidly took first year Greek, biblical, he can, he, he, biblical Greek and first year biblical Hebrew, um, right when I got started. And here's the deal. I'm not really wired that way. I can, I can plow through. I can stick my head down and put it through a wall. But I'm not really wired to take both first semester, first year Greek and Hebrew at the same time. And so it's a bad plan. I wouldn't recommend it. But when you have insomnia, it does actually give you a little bit more time to study. What also happens when you don't get enough sleep is your body craves energy. And when your body is left unsatisfied by sleep every doggone night, it still wants that energy. So your body says, I'm going to find that energy somewhere. For me, that manifested through 
food cravings. That's lovely. Maybe some of y'all can connect with being hungry and then eating and then not being hungry anymore, but still stuffing more down your gullet. Okay? Has anybody ever heard of this day coming up called Thanksgiving? (laughs) When the body is deprived of sleep, it triggers things in an attempt to achieve what it needs, which is energy. Food provides energy, but it can't fix a massive sleep deficit. No matter how much you eat, that debt of energy will never be satisfied with the extra food, even though your body will trigger a thought that tells you you need to eat to accomplish that energy. We need sleep to be satisfied. The extra food just makes us feel terrible, and it gets us nowhere closer to the realm of any fulfillment. You see, I find that the more good sleep I get, the better I can control what I eat. I find that the more good sleep I get, I can actually be satisfied. Now, I'm making a parallel about satisfaction here. The more I find that I love God, the more I'm satisfied in him. And, and I find that I want more and more and more for others to experience that same Jesus satisfaction that only he can really provide. You see, we'll go somewhere else to try to find it. We're going to be left wanting. And so I'm able to love people better. And not only am I not satisfied in loving other people better, like the the text tells us we're not supposed to be satisfied, I don't want to be satisfied. I want them to know Jesus. And if, if I was satisfied, then I wouldn't make any efforts to show people the light of the world, which is Jesus Christ. So how good is it that we're not satisfied in loving other people? The debt can never be paid. You dig? Kill them with kindness, right? Keep stuffing that love down their their gullet. I like the word gullet. As you love more like him, you can love others in a way that will never end until you're with God himself. So the more we, we love God, just as the law tells us, the more we come to know The truth, which is the law leads us to love. It doesn't seem like that's how it would be. This is what we see here. And then we live it out and we learn it's true. Verse 9 says, For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And I I have an important question, I think. I don't know if it's an important question, but I think it's a relevant question. What if you hate people? I mean, real, I think it's it's an important question to ask because sometimes, maybe a lot of times, Christian or not, I don't really love people or I don't really want to love people at least. I think that's a real thing. Okay, the law leads us to love, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. I get it, right? But how do, how do you handle this if you really just kind of hate a few people? I mean, what, what if you don't hate people, but you, you really are just uncomfortable around people? Your anxiety goes so high, goes through the roof when you're present with others. It's hard to love. What if the people you've loved so deeply in your life, maybe an ex-husband or an ex-wife, abused your confidence in in sharing in a love relationship. You're so angry and hurt that your posture towards people is one of caution and protection, but certainly certainly not loving. How do you deal with this text if you spend an inordinate amount of time among unlovable people? Maybe you, maybe you find such political frustration that you feel the other side's ideology is genuinely harmful to you, and even more so, harmful to your family, and it makes you angry and protective. How can you love someone who opposes pretty much everything that you are? Maybe you have a profound struggle feeling accepted in the world, even inside your own home. And any emotion that could potentially find itself in the, in the general universe of love is more likely heading towards depression, or even worse, it's heading towards despair. 
Family, there are a multiplicity of reasons why loving others seems impossible sometimes. But family, loving others, which is the command of Christ, the fulfillment of loving God, I want to tell you guys, it's close at hand. You ready for me to tell you a little secret? I got a trick here. I'm going to tell you how you can love others. You ready to learn a trick? You ready to write this down? Dab your pencil like people used to do in TV shows. They'd always dab their pencil on their, I don't know what that does. Here's how you can learn to love others. Pray. You pray. I'm serious now. You pray. You pray for that person. You pray without ceasing. You pray for that person. And and, and as you pray for that person, without ceasing becomes part of who you are. You pray without ceasing. I mean, that's something, right? I remember the first year we lived in Kansas City, and I was at the gym on the treadmill. I was hoofing it out, baby. I was doing it. I was sweating so much. And so no one realized that I had tears running down my face. And it wasn't sweat tears either. It was was cry tears. It was tear tears. I was praying while I was running. I found myself praying while I was running at the gym full of people in the daylight. Nobody could tell. What do I care anyway? I was bigger than them. (laughs) I believe that the God whom I love and who loves me was listening with a heart that wants me to pray to him. And I believe that the Holy Spirit prompts us to pray, and so we glorify God in our actions, and he changes our hearts so that we can love like he loves. In God's grace, as we present ourselves a living sacrifice, it isn't us who is the greater, but it's him. And, And one of the greatest ways to present ourselves is in constant prayer. I don't mean to be a weirdo who walks around like self-flagellating with rosary beads. I'm not Catholic, so I don't know how that works anyway. When I bring myself before God, I pray for, and I pray for others, God shows me how to love them by changing my heart. He sanctifies me. Little by little by little, he makes me a little bit more like him. This is important to Kelly and I, my wife. It's important to us that we we teach this to our kids. For close to 15 years, we prayed over our kids nightly a a prayer. And each time we add a kid to the family, uh, we add a kid to the prayer. I mean, maybe my wife's pregnant. I don't know. Hopefully. Hopefully. She's not. I wish she was. I'd like to add more kids to this. Here's how the prayer goes. God, we pray that you will teach Reagan, Lincoln, Juliet, and Marzi to love Jesus. God, we pray that you will teach We pray that you will teach Reagan, Lincoln, Juliet, and Marzi to trust Jesus. We pray that you will teach their hearts to love your will. God, we pray you will teach their hearts to trust your ways. God, we pray that you will break their hearts for people as your heart breaks for people. And God, we pray that you will give them your eyes so they will see people as you see people. And God, we know what that means is you're going to need to give Reagan. I shouldn't have looked at my kids. You need to give Reagan, Lincoln, Juliet, and Marzi a new heart. And that's what we pray more than anything for these four goblins. Amen. <laughs> Family, loving others is tough. And it takes interve- the intervention of the Holy Spirit to help us do it. Don't hear that sentence lightly. It takes the intervention of the Holy Spirit to love others as God loves them. And so we want our kids to hear us pray over them. To God. Revealing that we know why they need a new heart. We want them to see that we know that they need a new heart. If, if they're going to love God and love people, that's what it's going to take. Holy Spirit intervention. Pray this prayer, family. Pray it over yourself. Pray it over your family. These verses tell us that if we love God, but we don't love his people, we're not walking in step with the Holy Spirit. We're not walking in step with how he loves Verses 11 to 14 read like this. Do this. It means love. Okay? That's what we've we've already presupposed. Do this knowing the time that it is already the, the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us... Behave properly as in, day, as in the day, like daytime. 
Not in, not in nighttime stuff, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. When Paul says, do this in verse 11, he's, he's pivoting on what we already now know, which namely is that we are transformed by God, loving our neighbor because we love and are loved by God. And he says, get after it. The time is now. He tells us, Paul tells us, the time for rest is past. Live with urgency. Paul says, do this. You are progressively being sanctified, changed by God to be more like him. God is transforming you. And not only do you know that, do you, do you know that Jesus is coming back, it also means that the clock is ticking. Knock off the dust and get after it. The way this is written, it leaves little room for frivolous uh, dalliances and delays and kind of spiritual uh, failure to launch. You love God. Now, now love your neighbor and get after it. That's the timber of kind of what Paul is doing here. The way the grammar maps out in verse 11, we could accurately understand Paul's verse 11 exhortation this way. Love because you know what the state of the world is and because you know who you are. Wake up, get up, get on, let's go. Guys, I labored. I labored for a few weeks now over that phrase, let's go. I honestly hate Tom Brady for making it popular. I can't stand that he's all of a sudden made it popular. I, I hated it when I was in junior high and high school when the team was busting their tail and, and, and there's certain kids who, who they weren't really giving it all they could during the season, certainly not during the off season, yet for some reason those guys are the first ones to say, come on, let's go, let's go, come on. I'm like, that's not leadership. Come on, man. But, but uh, I, I've had to, I, I've, had, I've realized that I, there's something else that I've missed. I have to admit something. When the salty dude with swagger walks in and he kind of tilts his head a sconce and he lifts those eyebrows and he looks at you through the top of his eyebrows and he says, let's go. That gives a little different texture to the phrase. That's what Paul is doing here. He's the guy that has the experience. He's the guy who's been there and done that. He's saying, we're prepared. Now let's get after it. That's the, that's the tenor that he's got. What I love about Paul is he keeps it real. The very next thing he acknowledges is that there's something working against this let's go. And he says it's our tendency to hit that snooze button. Verse 12 and 13 say, stop living the type of life that belongs in the dark. You know Jesus, you're a daytimer not a night timer, so act like it. Yes, there's darkness all around, but the return of Jesus is imminent, so act like it, he says. It's nearer now than ever. Paul says, Christian, even you are susceptible to the temptation of being conformed to this world and not to be conformed to Jesus. We are all susceptible to hitting the snooze on sin. Now, what I mean by that slightly awkward sentence is, is we are all susceptible to hitting the snooze and pushing, off, pushing it off till later. A life, that life, that life of living a life marked by loving our neighbor. We push it off till later. Living a daytime life, like growing into a mature Christian, the time is now, Paul says. No more hitting the snooze. The worst sound in the history of sounds is the alarm clock. And I don't know why we want to do this, but we hear the alarm clock and then we hit the snooze, bink, and then nine minutes later, we hear the worst sound in the history of sounds all over again, and we just repeat it and repeat it. I'm like, why do we do this? It's, it's, it's torture. It's terrible. Paul's calling us out. He's like, I know you do that. I know you're not wanting to live that life all the time, Christian, he says. Time is now. He gives a few examples of what he's talking about by reminding us of a few of the love your neighbor commandments. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness 
and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. He's saying that just because we're saved by grace, we aren't to live a licentious life. Again, this is a callback to to chapter 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to the world. But I want you to notice something here. Paul's kind of saying, don't be conformed any longer. You see, he's recognizing we kind of lean that way a lot, or at least sometimes. I mean, keep in mind, he's talking to me and you. He's talking to Christians. He's observed how Christian people function, and he knows that we need a reminder to renew our minds, pursue God, and and have the Holy Spirit transform us. So in, in this letter, the author really isn't speaking in direct response to things happening in the church. That's not how Romans is set up, actually. But it's clear that he understands how we humans function. He's been a great observer of of humanity. He's saying, wake up and and get to what you know and who God is making you into. He, He spots it. He knows what we're doing. He knows we have short memories. He knows we're forgetful people. He knows that we take offense to everything. He also knows that vengeance is God's and not ours. He also knows that the righteous indignation that we think is ours, that we like to go and take because it's it's God's, we like to take it from him sometimes. He knows that ain't for us either. He knows that the righteous indignation is unequivocally, singularly, without question, God's only and alone. We have the expectations of other people and we never share them with those people. They don't meet our standards. He sees it. Paul knows what he's talking about. These are the ways we think in so many other ways, and Paul knows it. And here's the truth time right here. Love God and love my neighbor is something every kid who's ever set foot in a church, in a children's ministry across this country has heard. But I will tell you, it ain't child's play. It is hard. It is hard. Kelly and I know that, and so we have been trying, as, as parents all do, to to prepare our kids for it. We have a lot of, we have a, little, a lot of things that we, we do with the kids. We have a little family motto, okay? Love God, love my neighbor, have fun, mix it up. Love God, love God is our, it should be our general setting. That should be our standard setting. Love my neighbor, that's what comes out of us because we love God. Have fun. That, that should be, that should be our, our, our general, you know, general posture. Let's, let's, let's enjoy this, okay? And mix it up. That's that, that's that sly smile to the side that says, hey, man, I'm about to get after this. That's how we want to approach loving God, loving my neighbor. That's how we want to do it, no matter what we're doing in life. That's what we want to tell our kids. We teach our kids this early and often because we recognize how dang difficult it is to love others. I mean, unless you're loving me because I'm easy to love. <laughs> Guys, I, we want them to have a memory where in moments of great challenge and difficulty and strife, They'll remember, even against their own nature, to find their way to the foot of the cross and be reminded what love looks like, real love, Christ. Be daytimers, not nighttimers, meaning live the kind of life of one who doesn't need the cover of dark. Step away from the behaviors that lead to sin and shame. Step into the light. Verse 12 is is a recognition that we will still actively, knowingly engage and even pursue sin. What Paul says to battle against this is put on the armor of light. Uh, One scholar calls it, uh, maybe a better translation, weapons of light. But what is that? It's love. Man. Paul is saying, family, wake up. Because we will tend towards spiritual laziness. And the longer we live in spiritual laziness, we will find ourselves groggy and even experiencing spiritual malaise. So he tells us, wake up, get up, let's go, and remember where you're headed and and remember who you are. Verse 14 reads, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. Paul talks a lot about 
the putting on, the putting off and putting on uh, in a way that we would talk about putting on clothes or taking off clothes, okay? He just told us in verse 12 to, to put on the armor of light or weapons of light. The, the context is that we are to live in the light of the day and not in the darkness. And so we must put on something that will be protective or handy, that will be useful for us as we deal with our own temptation of conforming to the world. Put on love. Verse 14, Paul takes a, yet another step that co- helps us codify you know, what now is the true summary of the law. Christ himself, God in the flesh, he says, put on your new life in Christ. He is the fulfillment of the law. Share in his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. You were dead, he says, but because of Jesus, you are a new creation. Put on Christ. Put it on. Like you wake up in the morning, you got to put your clothes on. So here's what I want us to ponder as we close our sermon ahead towards baptism. The purpose of the Ten Commandments was to drive God's people to complete and total reliance on him. It wasn't to save them. The Messiah was intended to be the Savior, the Son of God, God in the flesh, Jesus. He's the one who saves. Being transformed is not simply something that I can, you know, kind of force on myself. I can brain my way to it. Paul says to his readers, sacrifice your autonomy to run your life and instead give all of yourself to Christ that the spirit of God would transform you. Every single other instance in the the Bible of sacrifice, except for Romans 12 verses one and two, every single other instance of the Bible of the word sacrifice includes blood and death. Someone's gotta die, something's gotta die, except for that one place. But Paul says, with your life, the Spirit of God will transform you so so that your life will be a direct reflection of Christ's work for your sin on the cross. We talk a lot about the gospel here at Grace, so let let me make sure we know what the word gospel means, okay? I share the gospel in every single doggone message I preach. I don't know what else I'm supposed to talk about, so here we go. God exists, and before his creation, in his perfect relationship, and love within himself, he was satisfied and in need of nothing. He chose to create everything, including us, so that we might worship him and bring him glory forever. But the first thing we did was stop listening to our creator. He defines love in every, and even creating us, and then, and then, and then we, have, we, we immediately start listening to everyone and everything but him. That's called sin. Turning your back to God, whether you're turning your back on his counsel, his wisdom, his sovereignty, his existence, turning your back to God is what sin is, okay? Our thoughts, our actions, our motivations, our intentions are always betraying us because we tend to pursue our own fame above God. God made us to be with him, to worship him, to glorify him, but we can't be because we try to be him. So he made a way for us to be with him. He wrapped himself in human skin and he came to the earth, was born as a baby, fully human and fully God. He lived as we live. He dealt with the same things we deal with, except he kept his devotion to the Father and didn't try to do the Father's job. You see, that's what we do. We try to control, we try to perform, we try to impress, we try to search for for something somewhere to make us feel whole and we look everywhere else except to Jesus for this. That's what sin is. But Jesus didn't sin. So he went to the cross, a perfect sacrifice, and he paid a debt that we owed God because of sin. You remember verse 8? It says, love is a debt that can never be paid. Look at what Jesus did. He went to the cross and he paid a debt that we owed God because of sin. He purchased our salvation on the cross so that we might have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. He was killed, put in a tomb, arose on the third day, defeating death, walked the earth for 40 days after he rose from the grave, and then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And if you believe this and you want to follow him all your days, you're a Christian. That's what makes you a Christian. If your hope is in Jesus Family, friend, 
You're saved and you're part of the family. I mean, maybe even now for the first time. Maybe you believe it just now. I pray that you would. This is the gospel and it changes everything. And in case you didn't notice what I was talking about earlier with this tank right in front of me full of water, we're baptizing folks in a couple of minutes. If you believe in Christ and you haven't been baptized, I ask that you, you start unsettling yourself from your seat. Come join Pastor Ed and Brian in the water. Get dunked today, okay? And proclaim with your new family the faith that you've got in your heart. Let's pray. Lord, you're good. God, we're grateful that you love us, that you loved us first. God, so I, I, I pray right now um, that you would, you would give us the courage to actually love others. God, it's hard to love other people. But Lord, I pray that you would not let it stray from very far from our mind that you are the place we look to in order to learn to love others. Lord, I pray that we would lean into learning how to pray and love others. God, so, Lord, I, 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 I pray knowing that you're doing a work in the people in this room, in your family. God, I, God uh, we lift this up to you as we prepare for baptism. In your name we pray, amen.